The conversation featured in this video was recorded a few weeks before Judy Human passed away on March 4th, 2023. It is the last of five final episodes of The Human Perspective. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to The Human Perspective. Today, it really is my honor to introduce you all to Gloria Steinem, who for many of us really needs no introduction. Uh, Gloria is a well-known international feminist. Uh, for me, I've always been um, very, how can I say, enamored, drawn to Gloria's uh, power, her strength of words and actions. And um, she's a journalist, has written many books. One of the books I was recently looking at was Gloria Stein and My Life on the Road, um, which is one of the books I think people should definitely look at. So welcome to the program, Gloria. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for those kind words. You know, all all writers are super insecure about our writing, so it's, it's great to hear you uh, recommend it. Thank you. Well, you know, I think um, using the word insecure is um, in many ways reflects how I and uh, many people, women included, feel. And um, in something that I was looking at, uh, it might have been in this book or another thing you'd written. Uh, you talked about a woman who, when uh, she would speak, sometimes would begin to cry. And I really resonated with that because as people who listen to the program can tell, I'm a little emotional about speaking with you right now. Mm -hmm. And um, over the last couple of years since COVID, as I've been doing you know, more and more public speaking, I've noticed that um, there are times when I'm feeling emotional. Sometimes it's because I'm angry. Sometimes it's because I'm happy. And, um, <laughs> but in the end, I think what is really important about this is, you know, bringing forward our true emotions. And for you, um, you've been doing your work for so many decades. At what point in your life did you decide that you really uh, were going to dedicate yourself to advancing the rights of women and other marginalized populations? Were there any incidents that occurred that moved you in that direction? I'm I'm sure they uh, there were many, and an initial one was my mother, which I think is true for so many of us, because she had been a journalist many years before I was born uh, and remained a journalist even after having my older sister and raising her for six years or so. But it just became impossible to do everything. And she had what was then called a nervous breakdown uh, and was hospitalized for a while. And when she came out, she just um, was addicted to tranquilizers. She, you know, I think that a lot of us were instructed by the unlived lives of our mothers. And that was certainly true for me. I hope it's much less true now because I hope mothers can, are much more likely to be able to live out their their own talented selves. You know, my mother um, was an activist, a uh, German Jew, and came over in the 30s and began to become an activist after I had polio because of all the barriers and discrimination and lack of law. So she was, and my dad were very involved uh, with other parents, which then turned over to their kids, many of us who also became activists. But I was always struck by as smart as my mother was and as act an activist as she was, that she was always understated. She was on a board of advisors for Downstate um, Hospital in Brooklyn, and they asked her to serve on another committee that was in Manhattan. And she was on lots of different boards and things in Brooklyn, but she turned it down. 
And I was like, Ma, why did you do that? And she said, well, I don't like going to the city that much, which <laughs> I know I knew was completely untrue because my mother went to the city all the time for the theater and museums and other things. It's not like she was landed. Oh, so what what do you think uh was restricting her? I think it was her owning her power. And uh she in certain circles really um used it but very frequently, I don't want to say in an understated way, because on the other side she was very powerful and frequently got what she wanted, but she was in some way understated. And mm -hmm. it was always something that I was intrigued by. And I think in many ways, a little bit of me, you know, where it's needing to push myself forward in certain situations. Once I kind of get over that little barrier and find that um, inner power within myself, I do push myself forward. Are there times in your life where you felt like you were um, learning and doing and needed to push yourself further forward to advance what you believed in? Well, when you say that to me, the first thing I think of is uh, public speaking. I had become a writer because I didn't want to talk. I think that's not uncommon for writers. Yet when the women's movement began and I was getting response to what I had written in what, the New York Magazine that was then new, we had just started it, um, I, I, I realized that it was important, you know, that something happens in a space together that can't happen on the page. I could not do it by myself. So I asked a friend of mine, Dorothy Pittman Hughes, who was, uh, I had written about her child care center. She had a pioneer uh, daycare center here in Manhattan. And I thought, you know, she's fearless. She's fine, you know, demonstrating and speaking in public. Um, also because I'm white and she is black, it, you know, we got much more diverse audiences than either one of us would have on our own. Uh, when she had a new baby and wanted to stay home, then uh, Flo Kennedy, who you may remember, the great Florence Kennedy, mm -hmm. she and I traveled together. So I, I guess I, basically I discovered about public speaking that you don't die, <laughs> <laughs> that, <laughs> that something happens in person that can't happen on the printed page, uh, and that you get to hear audiences, and that audiences are incredibly smart. Um, you went to Smith College and I got an honorary doctorate from them last year. Oh, that's very year. smart of them, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but when I was at Smith for those few days, it was very clear that it was a very rich environment because it was a small, still is a small school. How did um, Smith lead you forward? Did it help you kind of develop your commitments and give you guidance and direction? Well, remember that I was there in the 1950s. All right. Yeah. So there was no visible, to me anyway, women's movement. And um, the then president of Smith uh, was uh, fond of saying that they were educated women, educating women in order to educate mothers. So <laughs> it wasn't as evident uh, because I, you know, it was the 1950s. But because I was engaged in avoiding getting married, I went off to India where I managed to get a small fellowship and I lived in India for two years. And that made a huge difference because that was close to the time of independence and revolution, the Gandhian movement, which turned out to be essentially a movement of women uh, was um, you know, very much present. And it was a great education. So when I came home, I, courtesy of India, realized that movements were possible and necessary. So when you came home from India, what did you do next? Uh, well, I uh, first tried to encourage people to go to 
uh, world youth festivals that were sponsored by the then Soviet Union, which was not that easy to get people to go to. <laughs> and then I uh, began to make a slender living as a freelance writer here in New York. So you moved from Ohio, right? Uh, well, I had moved from Ohio when I went to college. Right. Right. And what drew you to New York? And what keeps you in New York? I love New York. I mean, for one year of COVID, I was in California and courtesy of very generous friends, I was living on a ranch there, which was beautiful, you know, could not have been better. And I just miss New York because, <laughs> because you can walk around here. You know, it's a pedestrian city. And I, I prefer that to car culture. Somehow you know, I, cars isolate us. I grew up in uh, Brooklyn and then I lived in Berkeley for about 18 years. And now I'm in Washington, D.C. And I'm very comfortable on the East Coast. It's it's different. And um, one of the reasons I'm here in D.C. is it's a newer city. And so their public transportation is much more accessible. So the ability to get around is easier here uh, in many ways than in New York, but I'm always missing New York. And when I go to New York, it's like such an amazing connection and energy and excitement. Mm -hmm. um, so when you talk about the 50s and uh, going to Smith College and how dramatically different it was than today, it's, I think, really similar to discussions in the disability movement because the movement was really just, I mean, there's there's been an evolution of women's movement, the disability rights movement for centuries in some way, but things really uh, began to pick up more in the 40s and 50s and moving forward. Um, I feel like we've, in the disability community, been, uh, making many changes, at least legislatively, um, so that things that used to be either unspoken about or accepted now, not always, but in many cases are um, considered to be discrimination in their laws to protect our rights. Yet, um, millions of disabled people on a regular basis continue to experience discrimination. If you look at the advancements that have been made in the women's community, um, including legislation at the federal and state level. What do you see as some of the major gains and where do you believe we still need to be going? Simply equal pay, you know, is, is very important. Uh, for us, uh, both of us in, in many ways, reproductive rights are crucial. Uh, and the simple idea that if we don't have say so over our own physical selves, we're not living in a democracy. Uh, and, you know, whether that includes anti abortion, you know, problems or whether it includes uh, pr problems of, of mobility for the disabled, it's, you know, it's, it's all uh, a goal of inclusion and an understanding that this really affects everyone at some time in our lives. I think for me, like you, the over overthrowing of Roe has been, I don't know why I have to say startling because it shouldn't be startling given the appointments on the court. But I think many people don't realize that disabled women are affected by this decision the same way non-disabled women are. And that this is a really perfect issue for us to be working in a more collaborative way on a state-by-state -state basis and nationally. And groups like the American Association of People with Disabilities have really been highlighting uh, the adverse impact that this decision um, is and will continue to have on disabled uh, young women and women. Mm -hmm. We've seen some important work going on at the state level where laws are now being passed that are not allowing the implementation of Roe within states. Where do you see this moving? 
do you see that this tragic decision um, as an organizing tool? And do you see it as one which is going to continue to grow? Yes, it definitely will continue to grow. Uh, it's a, a different now because uh, states like New York and California maintain a reproductive freedom as a goal and a re reality. So it's not uh, the same everywhere, but it is clear that, as I was saying, unless you can make decisions over your own physical welfare, that you were not living in a democracy. I, th I think what we haven't realized communally as a nation is that all dictators in the past that I'm aware of have started by trying to control reproduction. I mean, the, the first thing that Hitler did when he was elected, and he was indeed elected, was to uh, declare abortion a crime against the state and to padlock all the family planning clinics. And Mussolini did the same because, you know, they wanted an ever-growing population. Uh, and in fact, e even the Catholic Church did not totally disapprove of uh, abortion. They approved of an abortion for a male fetus a certain number of months and a longer period for a female fetus because they wrongly thought that men being superior quickened earlier. <laughs> which was not true. But anyway, they, uh, the, the Pope was influenced by Napoleon III, uh, who wanted more soldiers for his armies. So he wanted abortion declared a mortal sin. And in return, he supported the doctrine of papal infallibility. It, you know, it's like reading about a current political deal. So I just want to say as a caveat, um, <laughs> you can see the listener that Gloria is an amazing historian. And when you look through her, read her books, you'll see that she has some really important pieces of information that most of us would not be exploring on our own. So thank you for that important piece of But we should be learning this. I mean, I, I agree with you totally. Historian. Uh, but it, this part of history should not be uh, held by a few people. It should be just a normal part of our history books. Absolutely. And I think it's um, allowing us to be looking at the importance of looking backwards and being able to bring some of these important pieces of information forward. It's a chronology that I think we need to really remember that so many of the things that we're working on are really repetitions of what's happened in the past. And we may be making progress in some way, but in many cases, we're still being pulled to the past. You've done some very important work, um, working with different communities of women, both in the US and around the world. What would you say are some of the areas that women from different backgrounds, white, Black, Latino, Asian, et cetera. What is it that we need to be learning about each other? And obviously disabled women who cut across all these communities. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think are some of the areas that we should be focusing on to really allow us to have a better understanding of the barriers that we're facing in order to be supportive of bringing people together as a movement in a really meaning, meaningful way? Well, I think the, the first uh, effort needs to be inclusion to understand that if we're organizing for a specific reason, we need to include everybody who is affected by that particular issue. Nothing replaces experience. It's better, in my experience, to wait until we have an inclusive group than to start <laughs> and say, we'll become inclusive later, because the group that starts always has a certain degree of greater ownership of, of the group. So uh, until the group looks like 
the the population that's affected by what we're changing. Uh, I th think it's important that we um, include and become more representative. Are there some examples that you have of work that you've done that's allowed that to move forward? Uh, well, uh, when you say that, I think of the simplest examples in my own life, which were going out to speak, uh, because as a as a writer, I had chosen not to speak, so <laughs> not to communicate that way. So I, I I realized that when I was getting invitations, I needed help, and fortunately, as I was saying, the the woman I turned to because she was fearless as a speaker. Uh, ran a pioneer child care center here. And because she's African-American and I'm European-American, we soon discovered that we got different audiences together than we would have individually. Uh, so, you know, we discovered how important it was to both of us that we did this together. And that, you know, there are many other such examples. Um, but I think sometimes inclusion is viewed as a penalty almost, you know, that, but, but it's not, it's a gift. Yes. I mean, I, for me, inclusion is so very important because, I mean, as you in some way understand, disability is lifelong. People acquire their disabilities at birth. And then people may be acquiring their disabilities as they're getting older. And um, the ability to recognize that there is no community of people that does not have disabled people in them. And so for me and many people, I think one of the challenging is maybe not the right word, but being able to get other communities, like I define myself as a disabled Jewish woman or a, a woman who's Jewish and disabled or depending on who I'm speaking with, <laughs> that mixture of three. But, you know, I feel very comfortable entering the door where there are disabled people. I certainly don't know everybody and there are many people who have disabilities very unlike my own, but I feel like we have a common bond which is our experiences are never identical. Nobody's experiences are identical, but they're very similar. The way we may be treated, opportunities that we may be denied, how we feel, how we move forward. Yet we are still not yet at a place where each one of these different stovepipes, whether it's Asian Americans or LGBTQIA community or women's community, whatever, really um, see disabled people from within those communities as equals. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that's true of everybody, of course, but I think as a rule, whatever group we're looking at, that we're in, that we're trying to enter into, um, people will talk about the difficulty in doing that. And I continue to think that much of that is because people are fearful of acquiring a disability. Really? Oh, that's interesting. I Because that's something, I mean, I thought it was uh, a lack of awareness. I mean, for instance, I'm, I'm in New York where the theater is very important. And so the accessibility of theaters is, is very important, uh, whether it has to do with assisted hearing or uh, entering or seating or what whatever it is, it's a very dramatic personal example. But it was all addressed through litigation. That's how come the theaters have become accessible. Yeah. I mean, you know, however it happened, it happened because of gifted activists like you who brought litigation and made it happen. And the same is true of voting and the accessibility of voting. Right. Right. So when your mother was experiencing depression and, as you said, was um, institutionalized, what were you learning at that point about the whole issue of mental health and depression? And, 
has that been something that you've continued to work on um, over the last number of decades? Well, the her period of, of greatest difficulty and hospitalization was before I was born. By the time I came along, she was um, somewhat able to function, but in need of uh, tranquilizers of the era, and you know she wasn't f fully functional. So, you know, I just became, in a way, and I think a lot of people, for different reasons, have had this experience that the child is the parent, and the parent is the dependent in in some ways. Uh, so that was an education in itself. And it just made me very aware of what might have been the the talents like my mother's and you know many others for different reasons that we have lost uh, in ways that were not necessary, that we were just not being inclusive. When I um, learned that your mother had been a journalist and then you became a journalist, I thought, that's such a strong connection mm -hmm. and how you've been able to really nourish that and create it and bring it to the forefront in a way that she was unable to do. And so that's a real kind of in Jewish tradition, <laughs> you know, it's her memories for blessing through yeah. you well, and that your is, pet. You know, the, the ways in which many of us are living out, as I was saying, the unlived lives of our parents, probably more frequently our mothers than our fathers, but in, in both cases. What do you see over the uh, next number of years, some of the both challenges and work that's going on here and around the world um, to strengthen, advance our voices, also emphasizing work and increasing discrimination going on against disabled women, I'm sorry, women in general, in countries like Afghanistan? Mm. Um, well, to ad address this country, I think that there is um, a negative awareness of the fact that we are now a majority people of color country. I mean, the first generation of babies who are majority babies of color has already been born. And for those who, um, have been brought up to think race matters as if, you know, <laughs> in a negative way, this is quite apparently frightening. And so you get these mottos like you will not, they will not replace us or, you know, the negative. Uh, the contrary to me is true that we're going to look more like the rest of the world. We'll be, have better relationships with the rest of the world um better food you know right it just it, it it's the contrary and we we need to be actively um saying that and explaining that to each other i mean i'm here in new york the city is very um uh, representative as a whole but my neighborhood is white why is that you know it makes makes no sense Right. So uh, reaching out when a, some apartment or home is available, just or just pointing that out, you know, that, you know, everybody is white here. I'm going to go snow blind. You know, what is <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> and and the accessibility issues, as, as you point out, I mean, I'm living in a in a brownstone that was built in 1850. It is not accessible. Right. Right. I think about your ability to continue to walk up and down steps <laughs> right. in a building like that. Um, you know, for me, the example that you just gave is very important because as it's not just our country, because when you look at countries like Japan, where their population is, uh, their, new, their newer born population is dwindling and they are needing uh, more people in the country, having to address issues of immigration, or when you look at Scandinavian countries or 
other European countries, which were also mainly white and immigration and things that are going on. We're seeing these changes around the world as there's more blending of different populations. And I think a lack of, well, I guess in reality, it's the uh, biases that we've had towards various groups based on religion or skin color or gender. Um, so I feel that the women's movement, where we've really been able to at least begin more discussions about how we blend, how we learn from each other, and the strength both from our common areas of um, strengths and our di different aspects about who we are that also provide different types mm -hmm. of strengths. Um, and I think disability very much is in that. And I was mentioning this earlier. I still believe that people really look at me and other people and don't quite get how it happens mm -hmm. and are feeling that there is a uniqueness in each person that somebody has done something that they maybe can't do. And of course, in the movement itself, what we're looking at is enabling people to see that disability is a normal part of life. And, you know, you may break a leg and only be temporarily disabled, or you may be in your 70s or 80s or 90s and be having, you know, losing vision or hearing or having some memory issues or physical disabilities, that shouldn't mean that you're, you know, running away from society. And I, I don't feel like we've really cracked that nut. I mean, honestly, Gloria, I find sometimes, and a friend of mine will say the same thing, that people don't know even how to say hello. That there really? is. I mean, that's that's kind of shocking. I mean, right. But very much the truth. I was talking to a friend the other day who is with a company where she's doing a lot of her work on Zoom and they've had some meetings in person. And she said to me, I really can't believe how differently I'm treated when I'm on a Zoom call and people don't see my wheelchair. Mm -hmm. And now they do when I'm in That's person. That's fascinating. So I believe we need to be entering into a more meaningful discussion um, with the general society, both as you're saying on how um, our populations are changing, how majority of children being born in this country are not white and what that means. And likewise, um, being able to introduce this whole discussion around disability. Mm -hmm. Well, I, uh, I we, we all find our ways of doing this, but I find it helpful to myself remember and to say to people that every, all, all of us, pretty much all of us, are going are or going to be disabled, quote unquote, at some time in our lives. So, you know, it's it's. Um, can be approached in a more universal way than some of our other divisions. Yeah, and I think some of the areas where there are natural alliances are like in home and community-based services because there are many people who are needing assistance in their home in order to be able to stay in their homes and not have to move to more restricted living environments. Yet, you know, with the Biden Build Back Better approach, which would have provided, I think, $450 billion to get disabled people off of waiting lists to be able to get support services in their home. And that went nowhere. Mm -hmm. um, and I think another powerful area where the women's movement can meaningfully be working within the disability community and the disabil disabled women's portion. When you're speaking to younger people today, what are you sharing with them? 
Uh, well, it it depends. Uh, you know, I try to listen first and figure out <laughs> what it is their interests or needs are. But you and I are both uh, striving to universalize, to explain our, our commonalities. Um, so uh, here in Manhattan, where I live, whenever I cross the street, I see the results of the work of Bella Abzug when she was in Congress, uh, which is, uh, you know, a four foot wide area with no curb. All right. Okay, originally uh, that was uh, disabilities <laughs> achievement, but it also aids everybody with a baby carriage, everybody, you know, with a grocery cart. I mean, you know, <laughs> whatever it is. So it's such a wonderful symbol to me of the fact that being inclusive is not a penalty, it's a gift to everyone. Yeah, I mean, I like to listen very much to people regardless of their age. Um, you know, one of the questions I think, you know, we talked briefly about earlier is how do you keep going? So I presume you get that question a lot. Yeah. And I'm wondering how you respond to that. Well, when you say that, the first thing I think of is that we are communal animals. And, you know, there's a reason why solitary confinement is the most severe punishment everywhere in the world, because we are communal animals, we need each other. Uh, so the upside of that is that if, you know, wherever two or three are gathered together, where, you know, people in your block, in your family, in your neighborhood, in your grocery store, uh, in your school, whatever it is, you become multi-dimensional and multi-powered when you're together uh, that is you know way more than the simple addition of you as individuals i mean one of the most difficult parts of covid was that we were deprived of gathering places on the one hand on the other hand we could see each other as you and i now are uh, at least those of us who were gifted with technology. And we, um, I, I think, began to realize outside the filing cabinets of our offices and our schools and, you know, our separations, the, the, how, how much more we actually shared and how much we needed to do this. I mean, I, you know, I don't think these communal forms of communication are going to go away when they're no longer as necessary as they used to be because they're a pleasure and they provide community. Yeah, I very much think that there's a, a need for a mix, um, the ability to be face-to-face -face and the ability to communicate. I mean, the phone, right, changed the world when people could pick up the phone and start talking now that we can see each other um, and talk at the same time. Uh, I think, you know, we all have examples of things that we started to do with friends that brought us together during COVID that we wouldn't have been able to have mm -hmm. previously because we live in different places. And I hope that we begin to think about um, access to electricity and to technology because there are of course, big portions of the world that don't have that. So, you know, we need satellites in the sky <laughs> beaming down so, you know, so that the, the uh, access uh, is more equal. Yeah, and I think, you know, again, getting back to this issue of the importance of intersectionality, um, when we think about one of the many impacts of global warming, for example, um, there is unequivocally an increase in the number of people who are acquiring disabilities, whether it's respiratory or whatever it may be. And again, I think the value of our looking at working together on issues like global warming, on issues like abortion, etc. at issues like COVID, 
and delivery of healthcare. If we're consciously looking at who are the populations that have been marginalized, when you look at the issue of access to technology and people living in rural communities in the US and around the world who don't have access, so don't have the benefit of things that some of us are really taking for granted because we can afford all these things. And the, just increased increase in aging. Exactly. And how I very much feel that just because you have an age shouldn't 10 or 20 years in advance make you start thinking about when I'm getting older, I will no longer be able to do X, Y, Z. But rather, you know, when you talk about your experience at Smith and what was being said about what, you know, young women were being prepared for, that would no longer happen at Smith. And there have been important changes which look at women and what our contributions can be and should be and will be strengthening people. Likewise, I think in the area of disabled uh, girls and women, I wanna really feel that the women's movement is getting it, that they're getting that when women experience sexual violence, it's more than just the sexual violence. It's the long-term impact of mental health issues, physical conditions, and others, where in many communities you see these women who through no fault of their own have been abused and then are not really brought into the women's community. In some cases, you know, where I visited, these young women are basically not allowed back in their villages after they've had children at 13, 14, 15 years old for no other reason that they have fistulas that were not their fault. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I talk- Where is that? You're, you're speaking of Africa and, yeah. As one example, but certainly it's every place. So, yeah, I think if we really understand the impact of discrimination, that in many cases, we don't want to call it discrimination, mm -hmm. but- whatever word you want to put on it, not looking at people equally, denying people equal opportunities, which then pop up all over the place. That's really where I think one of our next big challenges is. Oh, I, you know, I think there's a helpful way of speaking positively. You know, we don't learn from sameness, as I would say. We learn from difference. So if we are not inclusive, we've deprived ourselves of learning. I think that's very true. It's really, I think it's a simple but very important um, principle that we should live by. And then the question is, how do we apply it? Because I think in many cases, what I made the statement before about sometimes people don't know how to say hello, they don't know what to call us. and. Believe me, I'm not going to get into that now, but it is such an issue where people say, what do I call you? And I thought, you mean Judy or Judith? No. Are you disabled? Are you the able disabled? Are you the differently abled? And how many of us want to be called disabled people, and some people want to be called people with disabilities, but we don't want any of these other terms. And so people will get stuck on just saying, hello, Judy, or hello, Gloria, or hello, whomever. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's at such a very basic level in many ways that being able to get to some of the more, I mean, I guess it's an equally substantive issue if you can't say hello, but <laughs> really being able to say, so how does the overturning of Roe affect disabled women? Or what is going on in the area of education for disabled people in the U.S. Or when we say that 70 or 80 percent of disabled children in certain continents with more girls not being educated who have disabilities, why is this happening and what can we do? That's a lot of what many of us are talking about, really being able to help each other not only learn, but feel like it is our responsibility to reach out and look at who are we inviting to the table? 
and mm. what's missing. Right. Yeah, no, and I think it's um, it, it shouldn't be presented as a burden. It's a gift, you know, because as I was saying, we learn from difference, not from sameness. Well, I think we're coming to an end and learning from difference is a great way to end because of the emphasis on learning. And I think that- oh, and because I get to see you again. I mean, it's been a long time. <laughs> I know. I think the last time we saw each other was at Sundance. In yes, it was. Right, with Hillary. Was, yes. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, I really want to thank you for the work that you've done and will continue to do. No, I thank and you. I thank you. I'm I'm glad that I'm living in a world with you in it. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you, vice versa. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Gloria. Or such a million eyes are pain.